every Thursday to our events here, either the center or the department. So try and pencil in Thursday evenings uh, for a public event, um, public lecture event. Um, and again, before I introduce our uh, speaker for tonight, I want to start by thanking the staff of the center, Ludmilla Applegate and Neil Cunningham, for uh, all the work that they have been doing um, uh, to get the series together, but to really get the activities of the center up and running. So thank you so much for um, being such a pleasure to work with, <laughs> among many other things. Um, also to point to a couple of our forthcoming events. Of course, we have a website, so you can go to our website and see the forthcoming events. But I want to point out to you have the lectures, upcoming lectures here, so I won't repeat them. But two special events, one on November 4th, it will be a book launch by our own Ahmad Paul Keeler, who will be launching his book and discussing, having a public discussion of it here. So it is uh, a Monday rather than a Thursday, Monday, November 4th. And then uh, at the very end of the term, on Friday, December 6th, we are doing something we haven't done before, which is something we're calling the Center for Islamic Studies Research Day. So basically everybody attached to the center um, will be giving a presentation of 20 to 30 minutes about the research. So the research associates associated with the center and the visiting fellows visiting the center and the director of the center directing the center, we will all have 20 minutes each to talk about our respective um, uh, research. Uh, and now to our speaker, it gives me enormous pleasure to launch the series by introducing and welcoming Jack Schenker, uh, old friend from Egypt and London. Um, I have an official introduction, so I will read, and then a couple of non-official personal things that I'd like to share with everybody. So, um, <clears throat> Jack Schenker is an award-winning reporter on politics and protest, whose work has been shortlisted for the All World Prize and translated into several languages. Formerly Egypt correspondent of The Guardian, an author of uh, The Egyptians, A Radical Story, a crit critically acclaimed book on the country's revolution and counter-revolution. His journalism has covered Gaza, Africa, Central Asia, the US, and the UK, and has been published in a wide range of newspapers and magazines, as well as being adapted into films by the BBC. His latest book, uh, now <coughs> we have your attention, explores Britain's ongoing political crisis from below, and has just been published by the Bodley Head and Vintage Books. He's based in London, so that's the official uh, introduction. Um, uh, the unofficial one, the personal one, <coughs> I would like to uh, just share a small, I won't tell the whole story, but um, I first met Jack on paper uh, by reading The Guardian in the middle of the revolution. I was in Egypt and I was, you know, marching and doing whatever the revolution is. Um, but we're also watching what is being written about what we were doing then, back then. And the only uh, worthwhile, I mean, of course, we're busy. We don't really want to read. We want to go <laughs> and demonstrate. But it was The Guardian, and it was Jack's coverage. And I remember asking uh, my friends, you know, who, who, who's, who's this? And um, uh, they were telling me, yes, he's the best, he's the best voice. Um, and I started following him, and I started learning that this is a different voice. You know, I've been in this business for a long time, and in Egypt, even before this revolution, you know, we have many visitors, many journalists who come for a quote, for a blurb, for some story, uh, or for some real uh, insight that they want to learn. But then, you know, journalism is journalism, and then you see that this person is then, the following week, is covering some beauty pageant, I don't know where, and uh, which is fine, you know, that is, that's the nature of the job. Um, 
what we saw with Jack is he's not there for this kind of job. He's not also there. You remember the famous um, phrase from, I think it was Said who said, the Orient is a career. Those who come to the Orient or go to the Orient, you know, they're making a career. Of course, he's talking about Orientalists and, and imperial administrators back in the 19th century. But we have the, the careerists who, the journalists who make a career out of covering uh, the events in the region without really being committed to it. It's not that Jack is committed as such. It's not that he went native and he became uh, an Egyptian, but it's, it's that he cares. And he cares about things that are not peculiarly Middle Eastern, uh, Middle Eastern or Islamic or Egyptian. He cares about the struggle that people all over the world are engaged in. He engaged, he's, 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 he's concerned about the struggle for justice, for dignity, which is a struggle that goes on in Brighton as much as it goes on in Tanta or Egypt or Cairo. Um, and that is what we saw. And I remember I then met you in one of the demonstrations, and I can't remember which one it was. I mean, I remember the vision, but I can't remember what it was we were shouting for or against. And you came to me and you said, so what is, what, you know, what is happening? What is the, you know? And I told you, you're asking me, you know better than anyone here, because you're committed, you're there, and there's a, uh, there's a, um, an, a, a genuine connection to, uh, to the events that we rarely uh, see in, in people who are covering big things as big as the revolutions in the, in the Arab world. Then the result comes <coughs> in not only these, but also the articles, I mean, Jack is a writer. He is a writer. He, his business is words, ideas, words. Uh, and the result is a very um, eloquent, but also um, serious and um, committed engagement with what he's covering. Uh, it's beautiful to read. It's very engaging. It's elegant. But it's also dignified, and dignified in the sense that, you know, the New York Times model of starting with an anecdote of a woman or a girl playing, and, and then she disappears. It's just an anecdote. It's a scene in order for the journalist to flesh out, you know, a serious argument. I don't want to belittle it. For Jack, the girl stays. The chapters are about these women, these men, these young boys, these young people and old people, it is about people and, and the ideas that they are struggling for and the lives they're trying to, leave, to lead, whether again in Britain or in Egypt, it is the same story. It is not about him. It's not about showing off his cleverness and his perception or, of course, there is a point to be made. Uh, there's an argument, there's a passion that comes across. Is a principal position that is always there. So I really could not have, uh, I mean, we wanted to have Jack last year, but he was busy really writing the book. So he, he uh, sequestered himself, or his publisher sequestered him and told him, no way, you're not giving any public talks until this is delivered. And it was delivered. I have to admit, I haven't finished it. But I, from the little I read from it, is it, it says, passionate and as engaging and as inspiring as, um, as this book. So with no further ado, please join me in welcoming Jack Schenker. Uh, hello, everyone. And thank you so much for that incredibly warm and generous introduction, Khaled. Uh, just to return the compliment for a moment, uh, there has been no better uh, friend and uh, discussion partner and comrade um, through uh, all of the turmoil in Egypt and since then, since uh, first you went to the States and then uh, came here, uh, you have been a constant and um, incredibly uh, important influence on my own work and uh, the way in which I perceive not just Egypt and not just the Middle East, but the ways in which history and memory and power and resistance interact in uh, all kinds of settings. 
Uh, I don't know if it's a coincidence that every time we seem to meet up in a different country, it's swiftly followed by a sort of populist, problematic authoritarian coming to power. I mean, first Sisi in Egypt, and then I believe that when I came to speak uh, in the States, uh, it was right before or after Trump's inauguration. And now here we are amid the kind of series finale of the United Kingdom with Boris Johnson at the helm. So uh, we should probably avoid meeting up in any more, you know, currently calm and democratic democratic countries. Um, but it's really lovely to be here. Um, I think the last time I was in Cambridge uh, giving any kind of talk, it was late 2015 or early 2016. And I think I began my talk by bemoaning the fact that politics in the UK was so stultifyingly dull, uh, which on reflection um, <laughs> makes me think of that uh, old Chinese proverb or curse, which is, may you live in interesting times, and we're certainly living in interesting times at the moment. Uh, I'm going to start today um, by talking about a friend and colleague of mine in Egypt, whom I'll call Kamal. And Kamal has curly black hair and an unruly beard. He's in his mid-twenties, and he suffers from a form of PTSD. He's from Port Said, originally, on the Mediterranean. But in 2011, when the revolution started, he came to Cairo because it was there that yesterday was crumbling. And if you saw something hopeful in that crumbling, something that made tomorrow look brighter, then Cairo was where you wanted to be. On the day it all began, he passed out in the fighting and woke up handcuffed to a hospital bed. When he tells the story of his escape, which involves a sympathetic nurse called Amira, and a botched attempt to drug the police guard, and then many nights spent in the torture cells of Gebel al the Red Mountain district of the capital where several security buildings are located. Kamal's eyes widen and vivify, and he rocks back and forth impulsively in his seat. These days, however, more often than not, Kamal's eyes are slightly glazed, and they rest on the middle distance. Kamal has been on my mind a lot recently and not only because of last month's outbreak of anti-regime sentiment and isolated street protests in Egypt, which has been met with a wave of state repression that, in its scope, if not its intensity, eclipses almost anything that's passed before. After spending many years in Cairo reporting on the twilight of the Mubarak dictatorship, and the revolutionary uprising that displaced it, and the counter-revolution that followed, I've spent the past couple of years, uh, as Khaled alluded to, back in my home country of Britain, trying to uh, make sense of the political crises that have enveloped politics here. And I'm very grateful for the shameless plug for the book as a precarious millennial without a pension plan whose life chances have been obliterated by a Tory government. Sort of shameless book plugs are the best my generation can hope for. So, so thank you. Um, the book is about where our current tumult has arisen from. Uh, what it looks and feels like beyond the institutional corridors of Westminster, about the lived experience of it for individuals and communities, and what new forms of political mobilisation are growing from its churn. The reporting from the book has taken me up and down the country and brought me into contact with many young people of a similar age to Kamal, people whose circumstances are in many ways totally unrecognisable from his own, and yet who seem to share certain commonalities with him. Sometimes these were fleeting, a look, a gesture, a turn of phrase, and sometimes they lingered. But all of them appear to me to speak to a mutual state of living through an interregnum of sorts, of trying to find one's place in the world at a moment in which old certainties, old rhythms, old political equilibriums were imploding but in which no one knew quite yet what would be constructed from the rubble. The story of one young man I met in Manchester named Kyle struck me as particularly resonant with Kamal's. And what I want to try and do today is explore briefly some of the ways in which political imagination, that belief or lack of it that our futures are malleable and that the tools to reshape them lie within our own hands, I want to explore the ways that has played a role in both of their lives and the common forces which are ranged against them. I don't want to overstate the similarities between Kamal and Kyle. Indeed, given the huge gulf in bodily threat and violent danger that confronts each of them on a daily basis, 
it would be facetious to try. And I really offer these thoughts as a starting point for discussion, not as any kind of definitive conclusion. But a decade on from the financial crisis that dealt such a visceral blow to the economic orthodoxy that has dominated most countries on the planet for 30 years or more, we are all living or stumbling through a global period of political liquefaction, plunging everyone into a whirlpool of possibilities that are both liberatory and revanchist, a whirlpool filled with hopes and dangers for us all. Those hopes and dangers take unique forms in every locality, but there are some threads, I think, that bind them together, threads that are perhaps worth interrogating. And through the tales of Kamal and Kyle, I'll try to do a little bit of that today. Kamal counts out the beats of his adult life by the political events that have shaped it. So, Comedy Show X came out after Rally Y, but before Court Decision Z. So-and-so's friend got married three weeks after this massacre. They took their honeymoon just as that sit-in was getting underway. For Kamal, places and times collapse into each other which is a messy business when you're physically navigating a metropolis as large as Cairo, while simultaneously trying to keep the ghosts of the past at bay. Mustafa Mahmoud is a street to the southeast of Tahrir Square, but it's also November 2011, when protesters battled to reach the Interior Ministry and the police resisted by blinding them with birdshot. Ithedea is the presidential palace in leafy Heliopolis, but it's also December 2012, and the fierce fighting between opponents and supporters of the Muslim Brotherhood. Rabah is in suburban Medinat Nas, near the stadium, but it's also August 2013, and the time Islamist demonstrators wrote the names and phone numbers of their parents on their arms so that their bodies could be identified, and the ensuing slaughter that left a thousand people dead. Kamal is not an Islamist, but he knew seven individuals who were killed at Rabah. The first time I was arrested and beaten, I was 19, he told me once, matter-of-factly, when I asked him what his personal milestones were. We were driving at the time, or more accurately, congealing in the stillness of downtown traffic, me drumming my fingers against the steering wheel, him with his feet up on, on, the, de sorry, his feet up on the dashboard, staring ahead at the empty space where the National Democratic Party headquarters used to be, the building that was burned during the 18 days, and then demolished when those that followed decided to bleach the urban fabric of awkward history. Kamal was silent for a time, then eventually added, the first time I carried a corpse, I was 20. Military service in Egypt is mandatory for those insufficiently moneyed or well-connected, and at the time of this conversation, Kamal had been extending a long-finished undergraduate degree for years in an effort to avoid being called up. But he knew that he couldn't do this indefinitely, and the deadline was fast approaching. He could get out of the country and try to claim asylum in Europe, as many have, but then he wouldn't be able to return and see his mother, who has hepatitis, the same disease that killed his father, and she relies on his support. So he stayed and smoked weed and went to cafes to play backgammon, because that way he could avoid talking. I've become a master in backgammon, he told me. I concentrate on playing because I don't want anyone to ask, how are you? And because I don't want anyone to ask the next question, which is, what happened? Or the question after that, which is, what will you do now? Every few weeks, that isolation got too much. In the aftermath of Rabah, unable to find a common language with the large numbers of people who cheered on the state's violence, but also desperate for human contact, Kamal pretended to be interested in renting a flat and accompanied a simsa or a property broker around several Cairo apartments, purely so that he can indulge in conversation. He chatted, with land, la he chatted with landlords about utility bills and deposit arrangements and walking distances to the metro, because that was so much simpler than talking about the things he'd seen in the morgue. He describes this city, Cairo, the one he came to because it promised to open every door as an open prison. I'm just waiting, he declared abruptly, as the cars in front of us retched forward a few inches and we followed suit. I'm just waiting, and I don't know what for. 
it, it occurred to me that uh, we happened to be level just then with the spot where the second field hospital had been situated and where the shabab had once stood with colanders and loaves of bread and strips of cardboard on their heads as the rocks rained down, forming the first line of the revolution's defence. They've put up new railings now and remodelled the air vents that rise from the underground car park in front of the Nile Ritz-Carlton so that the space around Tahrir is diced and bordered and it will be much harder for unsanctioned crowds to ever, to ever spill into there from the margins as they did before. There are the same patterns in the brick tiles over and over and over again. It looks like a self-generating computer landscape that could stretch to infinity without ever being interrupted. Maybe it always looked like this, I remember thinking to myself. It's just that before, there were so many people jostling on top of those tiles that you couldn't tell. I asked Kamal about imaginative horizons and how they expand and contract and about his capacity to visualise a different future from the one that surrounded us that day as we finally escaped the traffic jam at Midan Abdelmonam Riyadh and nosed our way up onto the 6th of October bridge. The expectations we had, they didn't just disappear, he replied. They became their complete opposite. It's not that our dreams didn't come true. It's that we tasted them and then they turned into the worst of nightmares. I think that when high hopes are suppressed, they become a deep sadness because energy, you know this from physics, right? Energy never dies. It has to turn into something else, another kind of energy or action. But here, there's no outlet for any of that, just a vacuum. The Egyptian dissident, Ali Abdel Fattah, who is a hero of Kamal's, he's been imprisoned under the regime of every major Egyptian leader in his lifetime, and he's currently behind bars once more recently claimed that the world is facing a dire crisis of imagination and that there was an urgent need to rediscover it. In a beautiful piece on Mother Moss, which is an independent Egyptian media outlet that's one of more than 500 websites currently blocked and censored inside Egypt's borders, Alaire shared some of the ways in which he seeks out new imaginative horizons with his young son, Khaled. This was before his re-arrest almost three weeks ago back when he was merely required to spend every night in a police station uh, as a condition of his probation for a previous conviction of breaking the protest law. The pair, Alaire and his son, would go tree climbing, Khaled often rushing towards a trunk and scaling its bark before suddenly realising he was too high up and couldn't get back down. Or they would read comics together immersing themselves in tales of fantastical superheroes who could bend the universe to their will. We run, towards, we run towards causes, incite revolutions, fall in love, wrote Mother's editors. Let's just say they are all adventures in nature, in our nature. More and more, it feels like everyone is stuck in trees. Two and a half thousand miles away, in a dark room in Lancashire, Kyle is flying pteranodons, his feet in the stirrups, body half upright to take the reins, surface noise fading to zero. Up high, Kyle explained to me, there's nothing to thud against your eardrums but the soft grunt of the creature's breath, the rhythmic flapping of its wings. When Kyle speaks of the things he sees from a pteranodon, Crags and overhangs of great granite mountains, sweeping waterfalls throwing up huge clouds of water vapour. His eyes shine and his frame slants forward, bobbing with excitement. It looks as if part of him is launching into flight, even as we talk. All of this is happening within an Xbox video game called Ark. And one of the reasons Kyle is so enraptured by computerised life in the air is that he's spent too much of his physical life on the ground. Some of that ground lies at the western end of Manchester's Ashton Canal, on the pedestrianised ramp that leads down from Piccadilly Station, in half crevices dotted along the edge of the station concourse, in the elevator that ferries passengers between platform level and the trams. It was the only place I could find where the floor had a bit of warmth. Everything else was freezing, he said. Benches are best, and air vents too. 
then anywhere flat and sheltered where you can lay a blanket. But finding a spot is competitive, so if other places are taken, you don't have much choice. The problem with the elevator is that security won't let you stay there for long, so it's only brief, then you have to go back outside. There were times during the two-year period in which he was homeless when Kyle had to get by on a single meal a day. At one point, he lost a stone in the space of a fortnight. It's weird, he told me. Being on the streets was kind of a relief because I felt like I could finally be myself and do what I wanted. I was still attending school, so I hadn't stopped caring, but I wasn't looking forward to growing up. The first time we met, Kyle had just been placed in temporary accommodation by social services. He was 17 years old. Kyle's from Oldham, a town on the outskirts of Greater Manchester that once spun more cotton than all the spindles in France and Germany combined. Today, it's the most deprived urban community in Britain. Kyle took me on a tour, pointing out his old schools, the takeaway place in Rippenham Road where he used to work, and that nearly everyone agrees is the best chippy in town, the beautiful and expensive homes nestled into the foothills of Saddleworth that seem forever distant and out of reach, and the streets around Shulver and St Mary's that he knows much more intimately and now tries to avoid. We wound up at the estate where he grew up, staring out at the grassy fields that played host to his childhood football games, and up at the window onto what was once his bedroom. Kyle's mother still lives there, but we didn't knock on the door. It's fine, it's life, he said, when I asked if he was okay. It makes you who you are. When Kyle was 11, his mother was diagnosed with a mental health condition and suffered, suffered a series of breakdowns. Kyle became the primary carer for his younger sister, who was nine, taking her to and from school each day and cooking her tea. Their older brother ran away, and so did the family dog. By the time he was in his mid-teens, Kyle's, mother had, uh, Kyle's mother's condition had deteriorated. She was taking drugs, lashing out, and verbally abusing Kyle on a regular basis. The two remaining children shut themselves away in their bedrooms to protect themselves and became increasingly isolated. One day, when Kyle was 15, things reached a tipping point. He fled from the house and didn't come back. In common with most people who experience homelessness, Kyle's journey didn't take him directly from his own room to sleeping on pavements in a single, straightforward tumble. Instead, he was battered about between different realms of insecurity, long stretches where he sofa surfed between friends and family members, Others where he found a short-lived bed in a squat or a shelter. Hard nights, cold nights, where the only thing available was the station elevator at best, or the ground outside at worst. Often, he found himself pressed up against the hoardings of one of the new housing construction sites that are everywhere in Manchester, advertising the best of UK buy-to-let, sophisticated design and high-end finishes. Be original, live original. Manchester has one of the highest levels of homelessness proportionate to its overall population in the UK. 30 new households in the city are forced into emergency accommodation every week, and the number of rough sleepers has risen 13-fold since 2010. Over the same period, thanks to heavy financial and regulatory support from the council, tens of thousands of high-end apartments have been built in Manchester by private developers. So many that the Financial Times has warned of oversupply in the top echelons of the market. On the nights when he tried to evade security and sleep in that Piccadilly station elevator, Kyle was literally yards away from great swathes of empty new housing units, piled up in developments like Cottonfield Wharf, which is part owned by an investment vehicle backed by sovereign wealth funds in the Gulf and headquartered in the tax haven of Jersey or Crusader Mill, a new private housing block that received £25.5 million in state aid and boasts a secluded courtyard complete with fire pits, barbecues, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth speakers. Like Kamal, Kyle's story is a microcosm of some of the wider dynamics that have moulded the country around him over the past decade. In Kyle's case, those dynamics include an economic model rooted in financialization, 
marketization and property-led regeneration that created a sharp demarcation between economic winners and losers. One that was presided over in Greater Manchester by a Labour Council firmly embedded in the technocratic third-way liberal consensus. And they include, too, the political decisions made regarding who would shoulder the burden of that economic model's failures when they came. Since Britain's austerity programme began in 2010, Oldham has been forced to cut a total of £208 million in public spending. That's almost half of its total budget. And that cut directly impacted Kyle at every stage of his path into homelessness. The year his mother was first diagnosed with a mental health condition, the charity Mind, which was responsible in Oldham for delivering the council's mental health support services, had its funding slashed by 80%. The following year, a local initiative specifically designed to tackle youth homelessness by mediating between families and runaway teenagers was shut down completely. Across the whole of Greater Manchester, children's services budgets now face a total shortfall of at least £25 million a year. Nationwide, councils are set to confront £10 billion of unfunded costs by 2020. Had a different decision been taken to insulate people like Kyle from the fallout of the financial crisis, rather than to protect the institutions and systems that created the crisis in the first place, Oldham might have been able to intervene at the various stages in which Kyle's family life got harder, preventing him from having to leave his mother in the first place. I've lived politics, Kyle told me, as we made our way alongside other young people to Piccadilly Station one afternoon, where the group were planning to occupy the concourse in protest at youth homelessness and take on any police who tried to stop them. Anyone who thinks this, all this, can carry on is mad. The Cambridge political scientist Helen Thompson has said that the post-2008 world is, in some fundamental sense, a world waiting for its reckoning. Kyle and Kamal have never met, but both are children of the financial crisis, who have come of age amid the falling apart of an economic status quo that previously appeared unassailable, and who discovered politics at a time when elites were trying, and often failing, to stitch that status quo back together. They both watched a deeply entrenched political settlement break apart in their respective countries. Settlements that, in different ways, attempted to detach citizens from politics. In Egypt, a paternal, exclusionary state that permitted its subjects to petition leaders for concessions, but never to trespass on its private fiefdoms. In Britain, a model of liberal market democracy that claimed to transcend ideological debate and assume the status of scientific law. They both saw an opportunity to exploit that fragment fragmentation, to reanimate politics with personal and collective agency, and both, albeit to drastically different degrees, are now confronted with a top-down attempt to stuff politics back inside its black box, to reseal its borders. Kyle and Kamal have both entered adulthood after the end of the end of history and are now ranged against political forces that use history selectively to try and cling on to power amid the ensuing storms. All this has at times enlivened them and at other times mired them in a deep depression, taking a corrosive toll on their mental health. Both are still waiting for their reckoning. In Egypt, the Sisi regime's fiercest enemy has always been the collective memory of an uprising that, as the blogger Bahia noted, remains evergreen, no matter how cleanly the walls are scrubbed of graffiti and how completely online archives of the revolution are censored and screened from public view, especially in the minds of the ruling class. Suppression of dissent is justified by an appeal to nationalistic unity. A strong leader, the only thing standing in the way of the country's enemies wreaking havoc. Enemies that lie both beyond Egypt's borders and within them. In Britain, 
a political project pushed by the hard right that is also rooted in a muscular assertion of ethno-cultural borders has depended heavily on the activation of certain historical memories and the stifling of others. Brexit's leading proponents describe their mission in terms of both imperial nostalgia and anti-imperial insurgency. We want our country back, insists Nigel Farage. Above all, we can find our voice in the world again, declares Boris Johnson. That last word, again, freighted with a meaning that dare not speak its name. There is a pattern consistent throughout history of oppressed people turning on their oppressors, said Brexit Party MEP Anne Widdicombe earlier this year. Slaves against their owners, the peasantry against the feudal barons, colonies against empires, and that is why Britain is leaving. In both countries, albeit from alternative angles, narratives of colonialism are being excavated and burnished to smother more disruptive social fault lines. In both cases, leaders attempt to legitimise themselves by rendering both invisible and hypervisible a hazy other, traitors, enemies of the people, disruptive foreigners seeking to degrade the security and prosperity of honest, hard-working citizens lurking in each nation's midst. There's something else, I think, linking the political context that Kyle and Kamal each find themselves in, and that, str and that struggle from above to reconstrain it. Something to do with the idea of governance as spectacle. Politics are something that happens elsewhere, in rarefied spaces, if at all. Not long ago, I wrote in the London Review of Books about a 90-second advert released by the Egyptian Tourism Ministry soon after Sisi assumed the presidency, part of a multi-million dollar partnership with the global advertising giant JWT. Accompanied by soaring violins and pounding drums, the video whisks viewers past images of opulent swimming pools, quad bike races in the desert, campfires presided over by smiling, crinkled Bedouins. No one speaks. This is our story, our drama, our theatre, our poetry, our choreography, the on-screen captions announce. This is Egypt. Earlier in that marketing campaign, Egyptians were encouraged to submit their own national imagery, sunsets, snorkels, and so on, via social media channels using the hashtag, this is Egypt. Many responded by linking to news reports about the torture and killing of citizens in police custody. Others mentioned the jailing of satirists, novelists, and journalists, the crackdown on civil society and the number of capital sentences handed down by military courts. Welcome to Egypt, someone tweeted from Cairo. The land of the imprisoned, forcibly disappeared and dead. We do hope you enjoy your stay. Several of these rogue contributions went, went viral before this part of the campaign was quietly but definitively dropped. It was clear that as far as the regime was concerned, Nothing good would ever come from letting ordinary citizens chime in. What is Egypt? Well, one answer to that question is that Egypt is a place where Egyptians themselves are not supposed to tackle the question and yet repeatedly find ways of doing so. In Britain, meanwhile, citizens are guided by the mainstream media through a succession of epic political shocks with almost no attention paid to the economic or social fault lines underlying them or how these have restructured the lives of ordinary people. Most journalists fixate almost wholly on the personalities, parties and parlour games of Parliament, as if the answer to where all this turmoil comes from must lie somewhere within its limits. It's a category error that's contributed to an epic disconnect. The breathless frenzy of Westminster on the one hand, where things seem to change at a thousand miles a minute, but are actually mired in stasis, and real life on the other, where we continue to go about our days as normal, even as, gradually, many of the political, economic, and social building blocks of the country around us are transformed. What a funny, contained emergency it is, observed the economics commentator Aditya Chakraborty 
on the means by which our current bedlam is routinely presented to us. It's as if the revolution of 1789 was being covered entirely from inside the Versailles court of Louis XVI. In Britain, the noise and clamour of institutional politics is reduced to a spectator sport, commented on by experts and consumed passively by the rest of us, our participation limited to a solitary trudge to the ballot box once every few, few years. At least, however, there is space open to those fighting to re-enchant politics on the ground. And my book is full of those like Kyle who are finding novel ways to do just that, from radical education courses run by young people to insurgent labour movements rewiring the economy from within, migrant collectives resisting the violence of the hostile environment regime, new unions of private renters taking on landlords in the streets. In Egypt, by contrast, no such space exists. For Sisi, there is something distasteful about the very idea of politics itself, predicated as it is on competing viewpoints. He wants a clean and unified narrative of national existence, unencumbered by marginalia. As Weta Leskander has written, this is a different form of authoritarianism from that which came before 2011. Today, even a managed ruling party, a largely subservient judiciary, and a media operating on a tight leash are all seen as too permissive to guarantee regime survival. Politics itself is now the enemy. The regime's fight is no longer about simply suppressing dissenting voices, argues Weta but rather a targeted attack on all spaces and battlefields that may be used to voice dissent, whether political, social or physical. The idea is not just for the state to win on the political battlefield, it's to eliminate the battlefield altogether. In Egypt, the regime has attempted to replace politics with static showpieces. The imagery of June 30th, the new Suez Canal, the building of a fresh capital. Perhaps that's why upheavals like the one we saw last month, when they have erupted, have assumed the form, initially at least, of carefully controlled visuals being blurred. As Leila Arman, who writes about Egyptian cinema, has noted, Muhammad Ali, the actor turned property tycoon, whose online videos helped to spark September's protest wave, is a man who knows how to hold the camera's gaze and stage a proper shot. Armin argues that whereas Sisi's regime goes to excruciating lengths to present itself as the avatar of the state established by the 1952 revolution as its final perfect culmination, Ali's filming was so powerful because it exposed the emptiness of that symbolism. Ali is not playing the old folk hero, familiar to hundreds of movies and TV series in the pre-revolution era, where the good guy was bathed in tropes of honour and decency and class solace, appealing to the state as a guarantor of the social contract. Instead, he's a product of the post-2013 gangster state, one where even the charade of the dictatorship acting as a neutral political arbiter between competing social constituencies has withered away. What he wants, quite simply, is his money back, and he wants it now. If this saga weren't real, it would be just the contrived ending to a corny film, concluded Armin. The state controls all access to images, but then a genie arises from the depths of Facebook. The state meticulously edits and airbrushes the photo, but is plagued by a live video of unvarnished speech filmed with a non-professional camera. As Kamal once said to me after we were held for hours at a military checkpoint while reporting a story about people smuggling near Rashid and then eventually released with a warning but on the condition that we gave our investigating officer a lift back to his home village, life is just a series of surreal paintings now but no one's given us a paintbrush. Kyle has had it rough of late. Uh, attempts to reconnect with his mother have foundered, and he's been wrestling with extended periods of depression. I'm hashtag optimism, he once said to me, 
a smile breaking across his large, open face. And he has some cause for optimism. Oldham's overburdened social services department has finally found him a permanent place to live. And he's been getting work, first as a warehouse uh, uh, assistant at a car parts re retailer, then a gig at a local telecom centre, cold calling mobile phone customers and trying to persuade them to upgrade their contracts. The minimum wage is welcome, but it's not enough. The pay is livable because you can physically live on it, just about, says Carl, but it's not enjoyable. You can't enjoy a life on it. Whereas Kamal is trying to escape conscription, Kyle dreams of joining the army. He likes the idea of service, of feeling like he's truly valued by something bigger and stronger than himself, at something more than £4.20 an hour. And when I last saw him, he was waiting to hear back about his application. In the army, he points out, you're part of a community whose worth is measured by something other than money, and you also always have a place to sleep. Meanwhile, he's doing his best to make his small one-bedroom flat the first place of his own he's ever known into a home. It's not the friendliest neighbourhood, he said ruefully, pointing out a shattered window pane in the apartment below. This is supported accommodation, so everyone in here has been homeless before, and lots of people are messed up. There's always trouble. Sometimes I wonder if I'm the only one who's sane. Debbie Blanchard, a housing campaigner who worked with homeless youth in Greater Manchester, believes that chronic insecurity, combined with a ruinous overhaul of the state benefit system, has helped to traumatise an entire generation of young people. The face of poverty, homelessness and destitution in Britain is increasingly a young one, she told me. And we are doubly hit by that because we are a young city. Debbie spends most of her days touring Manchester's homeless squats, the ones that are left, that is, after a series of violent evictions carried out by police and private security forces. And she's continuously checking in on dozens of young people for whom she's a source of everything from legal advice to toothpaste. They call me the crazy auntie, she says. I know their shoe sizes, I know their histories, I know that someone has to keep battling for them young men and boys, teenage girls, in a way that you simply would not have thought socially possible even just a decade ago. These groups are increasingly disconnected, destitute, and targeted on all policy fronts for collective punishment. It's a tearing of the social fabric, and it's left many of these kids with a kind of PTSD. One chilly winter's evening, a few months after the council first managed to secure accommodation for him, Kyle walked out of his flat, purchased a packet of paracetamol from the nearest shop, returned home and overdosed. I just didn't want to do it anymore, he said softly, averting my eyes. My mind was just a blur. I was struggling with money, no family support. I was feeling alone, and that's what happened. After swallowing the pills, he wandered downstairs in confusion. An ambulance was called and doctors worked overnight to save his life. He still struggles with loneliness and with that sensation that can creep up on you at the strangest moments of there being no one who cares. But he's hashtag optimism, most of the time anyway, and he's discovered novel ways to fight back. Recently at work, he found himself chatting on the phone to a young woman doing a philosophy degree at university. Kyle was intrigued, and in between pitching a monthly text bundle and data package, he smuggled in a whole string of questions about philosophy, about her studies, about the ideas contained within them. If you get to a part of the conversation where you've stopped selling, you can get in trouble with the supervisor, he told me. But this call went on for absolutely ages. It was brilliant. And then, of course, he has Ark, the Xbox video game populated by fantastical animals that allows you to team up with strangers from around the world and build an alternative universe. When he's not working, Kyle will sometimes play Ark for more than 10 hours at a stretch, curtains drawn, lights off, a headset over his ears and a microphone angled towards his mouth. Participants form alliances and they share resources, organising their nascent societies however they see fit. The in-game rules are accompanied by an informal etiquette among players, 
one that Kyle takes very seriously. Breaches of honour infuriate him. He described his current game to me in detail. He and some of his regular ARC friends had built what sounded to all intents and purposes like a delicate but vibrant democracy with resources for all and plenty of space to fly around peacefully. In the real world, there are people who look for confrontation, but here it's different, he said. People are friendly and cooperative. Ark offers Kyle a universe in which there are no limits to what can be created, other than those imposed by your own imagination. A universe regulated by a shared set of rules that provide everyone with an equal chance. It's a safe haven, he explained. When I'm in Ark, I can't hear reality. That's my re reality now. Kamal also finds refuge in computer games. But in his case, they often feel less fantastical than reality. The conversation between the two of us in the car that I recounted earlier took place as we were on our way to Giza for an appointment with Dandrawi Al Hawari, the co founder and executive editor of Yoma Sabah, a punchy, popular media outlet that racks up more readers than almost any other and offers the regime full throated support. I've been fascinated by Al Hawari for ages. Of the many establishment columnists who dominate the evening papers, he's usually the loudest in his outrage and the rowdiest in his conspiracy theories. He's particularly hostile to other journalists, especially foreign ones, and to lily-livered liberals who complain about police abuse, and to the country of Qatar, which is supportive of the Muslim Brotherhood, and which he's convinced has been exporting gays to Egypt in an effort to encourage debauchery and the wearing of women's clothes. Egypt could occupy Qatar with a folk music band in just two hours, Al Hawari once claimed, although he added the caveat that it would debase the Egyptian military to bother to do so. Outside the newspaper's offices, security guards in black shirts paced up and down and muttered into walkie talkies. Stage by stage, gatekeeper by gatekeeper, we were ushered into the building. Al Hawari was waiting to shake us by the, by the hand, wearing glasses an expensive-looking wristwatch, and a pink striped shirt with the words Le Grande Metropole embroidered above the cuffs. I wondered what El Hawari would make of Kamal. A few weeks earlier, he penned a column accusing political activists of being the willing dupes of Egypt's international enemies and insisted that male revolutionary types were so effeminate that it was impossible to distinguish them from their female counterparts. Kamal is unshaven and wears a scruffy top. He looks like a revolutionary type because he is a revolutionary type. But El Hawari was in a generous mood that day and if he did have any criticisms of Kamal's appearance, then he checked the impulse to share them. Let me make this clear first, he proclaimed with a sort of booming geniality as we took our seats in the conference room. I stand with the state and with stability. Coffee was brought in and El Hawari broke off to dab at a rogue splash of coffee grounds on the table. You'll notice, he said in a low tone, as if confiding a secret, that there is not a scratch in this whole building. We take care of cleanliness here. He explained that smoking and beards and the leaving of jackets on the backs of chairs were forbidden for Yomasaba employees in the workplace. He told us that his academic background, studying Egyptology, had taught him the importance of order and of things being in their right and proper place. We cannot afford more demonstrations, more uprisings, he warned gravely. I don't understand why people keep doing this, why human rights has to mean protests, because what comes with that is ISIS. This love of disinfection must make Cairo unbearable for people like El Hawari, who yearn for a more sanitised universe. The revolution left jackets on the backs of chairs, and then it threw chairs through the windows. But this is their moment now, El Hawari's and his ilk. And maybe that's why they're building that new capital out in the eastern desert, the one that sparked Muhammad Ali's incendiary accusations of corruption and the subsequent protests why they're plunging billions into wide, tidy boulevards and neatly segregated business zones while bread riots play out in the old cities left behind. 
I've been to the construction site, a sprawling area just south of Medina Badr, and paced across the helipads and the hotel complexes and the ceremonial mound from which Sisi will one day inaugurate the future Cairo. It's bleak and it's sandy and it's wrapped in a frayed tarpaulin. The regime believes in a binary choice between total chaos and total control. And if current Cairo is the former, then this new capital will be the anti-Cairo, purged of its itinerant shrimp sellers and its outdoor mattress stitchers and its pairs of lovers holding clandestine hands whilst crouched in the scummy underbelly of the 15th of May bridge. There'll be no place in the new capital for white bedsheets strung up between lampposts by rebellious teenagers and pressed into use as makeshift cinema screens, projectors powered by hacked electricity boxes to broadcast illicit footage of army atrocities to the streets. There will be no audience for the bedsheets because the new capital will be the antithesis of density. And anyway, the lampposts will be too far apart. I spoke to an engineer out there who told me that the state's synthetic new home will boast the second biggest dancing fountain in the world, and I didn't know what to say. Afterwards, I met a group of dust street labourers who were helping to build a wall which will eventually encircle the whole city, insulating it and its inhabitants, the first of whom will be Egypt's government's ministries, from all those jackets on chairs and spilt coffee grounds, from the smoking and the beards, and the rest of recent history's unpalatable debris. An urban planning expert described the new capital to me as a bad version of the Truman Show, but up close, it looked more confused and menacing than that, more like an attempt to draw a line under an unfinished story, but one that just falls short. The section of the wall that the labourers were working on reminded me of a medieval fortress, massive and unyielding. One of them unzipped his trousers and urinated on it. This town is for the happy people, the ones who fly above us, he said. I asked El Hawari whether he saw me as a direct and deliberate conspirator against the Egyptian state. And with a plight and concerned paternalism, he assured me that he did. I asked him who was employing me and orchestrating this conspiracy. And in the same sentence, he mentioned Hillary Clinton, Qatar, MI6, The Guardian, Israel, The Daily Mail, and the BBC. There didn't seem to be much left to discuss after that. So we exchanged some more pleasantries, and he led us out of the conference room, conducting a tour of the office artwork on the way back to the lifts. The corridors were lined with large, colour-saturated photographs, a simple man in a traditional galabea, a soldier with a single tear rolling down his cheek, a bird's eye shot of crowds in Tahrir with huge Egyptian flags being held aloft. And then finally, a studio close-up of Angelina Jolie. Kamal glanced at me and risked the swiftest of eye rolls. This was a roller coaster ride through the regime's schizophrenic subconscious, and every single frame was mounted flawlessly to the wall. Kamal and Kyle's flake. Sorry, Kamal and Kyle's fates are interlinked, and not just because the governments that rule over them are too. Sisi's regime depends on the financial and military support of its sponsors in the global north. Britain claims to be the largest foreign investor in Egypt and made it a guest of honour at the recent DSEI arms fair in London. Since Sisi took over, the UK has licensed £140 million worth of arms sales to Egypt. And it's the British engineering firm Bombardier that will build the monorail to carry commuters back and forth between Cairo and that new administrative capital. For its part, Britain's planned exit from the European Union has left it in more need of other international trade partners than ever, which helps explain why Boris Johnson made no mention of democracy or human rights during his recent meeting with Sisi at the UN General Assembly. As democratic norms are increasingly violated within the citadels of the self-proclaimed custodians of democracy, like Britain and the United States, authoritarian political projects the world over are fueling one another. As the writer Pankaj Mishra has observed, the barbarians, it turns out, were never at the gate. They've been ruling us for some time. But Kamal and Kyle are interlinked too, I think, 
because of the circumstances in which they contemplate the world around them, the elasticity with which their political imaginations have been stretched, and the violence with which, in Kamal's case at least, snapped back. I don't know how many parallels can be drawn between their two lives and the struggles they find themselves enmeshed in. I don't know how useful it is to interweave their stories and see what knots are formed from the tangle, what echoes can be heard in the collision. But I do know that we are witnessing, all of us, the end of a historical paradigm without a new one fully formed and ready to fill the void yet in place. I do know that we're living through the simultaneous slow burn decline of a still present past and the birth pangs of contested futures. And if we want to understand that process, it's to people like Kamal and Kyle, just as much as Abdel Fattah al-Sisi or Boris Johnson, that we should turn. And I know that personally, at least, Kyle and Kamal are, in different ways, a source of optimism. The uh, cultural theorist Raymond Williams argued that to be truly radical is to make hope possible rather than despair convincing and their tales despite being laden with all that pain and suffering do just that for me thank you very much and i hope uh, we can have a lovely discussion on some of those points <laughs> touches on what Andrew is mentioning, because I think what is what CC and, forget the Labour Party, but what, what the right is saying is that not only will we not go back to Keynesian economics, but also that this short period of representative democracy not only is over, but was probably a mistake. And I think what they are proposing is a new model that is very scary in, 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 in its boldness. And I think some of them, and we keep on dismissing them, but these people are up to something. You know, Trump is not stupid, and Modi is not stupid. And, um, um, and they are challenging that, uh, that principle. At its very core, not only the economic side of it, but the, 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 the ethical, political side of it. And, and they are offering what CC is offering. They are offering a fortress, mm. uh, heavy, fortified, segregated uh, urban uh, centers, and will be, and, 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 and no prisoners taken, and will not even make a, 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 a pretense that there will be a representative. Uh, government. When I started, I've been following the project of the new capital city before it was built, because there is a, a, a in the mentality of the Egyptian upper class, there is this urban uh, 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 image of, of the segregated city even before CC came to power. But this project in particular is something that initially I dismissed. I have to admit, I, I thought that this is a regression. Mm -hmm. the, the, the historical trajectory of, of Egypt, as the, of Cairo as the capital of Egypt, and where it was the seat of government, the seat of government usually was in the citadel, up in, in you know, the, the overlooking the city, where very often the city was literally bombed from into submission. Um, and then there was a new beginning, I mean, I'm not saying that Egypt was on its way to democracy, but there was a new kind of politics whereby the seat, the, the seat of government actually moved down. And it was represented by Ismail building the new city and himself moving the seat of government, his palace, to the very center of the fabric of the city, the urban fabric of the city, with Abdin Palace. And the seat of government remained there. And then there is this idea of, of leaving Cairo, abandoning Cairo, and building a fortified capital that I thought was a big reversal of the historic trajectory of how the capital of Egypt over the centuries had evolved. And I thought that this is a, a reversal uh, to 
the citadel model. But this time it's actually abandoning the city. And I think one needs to think of what is happening with this new capital uh, city, where it is, very, you know, it is heavily fortified, mm. heavily segregated. And it offers a, a representation of politics that is far removed from anything we've seen before. We will rule, I mean, he's building two capital cities, actually, Al Alamein and the, the, the summer capital and the, the winter capital, connected together by a high-speed rail link to which a handful of people, you know, like a minuscule percentage of the bureaucracy of Egypt and of Cairo and the uh, military elite and the uh, Western uh, embassies and the, and, the, and, the, and the companies will be ordered, they have already been ordered to relocate. And leaving Egypt away, not to rot, but to be bombed, mm -hmm. to be monitored in this way, and to be segregated this way, and to be controlled and monitored in electronic surveillance and in heavy police and military presence. And that is the model. I always thought, where is the image? This guy is not offering us anything. He's leaving us. He's abandoning the country. He's building his own fantasy city and leaving Egypt. But I think your question, I've been thinking about this, actually, no, this is politics. This is the new politics. This is the model of how politics will be run. Of course, he's building a parliament, but he's building an octagon. The Ministry of Defense in Egypt now is turned an octagon after the Pentagon, but we will be bigger than the Pentagon. It actually is bigger than the Pentagon in its area. And it is an octagon, not only five, eight. And it's a huge complex. And he's not, and this is why the, 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 um, the, the videos of Muhammad Ali were very apt, because mm -hmm. it is about this. Mm -hmm. uh, it had to come from within the, it was very interesting that the biggest criticism, the most effective one, came from within this very same uh, model that he's building, highlighting its vacuousness. Yeah. Of course, Muhammad Ali is, you know, is part of this yeah. mess and part of the regime and part of. So he, you know, he attempted to try and see things uh, in a different way. But I don't think he has enough imagination. But I think it is a scary thing, and I think we should take it seriously. It's not just abandoning Egypt or abandoning politics. It's a new model of politics. Time for one more question. Yes. Um, I thought your speech was really beautifully written. Um, Thank you. And it strikes me that you pay attention to language and words and what they mean, their implications, and they're really well chosen, the analogies that you found. Um, journalists, I would like to know what your impression is, and politicians, in recent times, I think, have been perhaps quite dangerous with the language they have used and have almost hollowed out the meaning behind them. Um, I'd like to know, you know what you feel your role is and how you use language as a journalist and whether you feel it's um, frightening the way language is used in our politics. And um, I am talking about Britain, I'm connected to Ankara, and I could ask you about that, I would as well. But, mm. yeah, what's Thank your Thank you so much for that. Yeah, I mean, I share your concern. Um, it's very, very kind of you to, 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 to say those things um, about, about the talk. And language is something that I think about a great deal, um, both in terms of my own work and relatedly in terms of, you know, not, not just what I'm writing, but what I'm writing about in terms of, you know, as you say, the way that words are used and misused and abused. Um, there is a chapter in the new book about Britain, um, which is set, each chapter is set in a different part of the country, uh, but linked to a kind of different theme. 
And there's one set in Dungaval, which is uh, an immigration detention centre south of Glasgow, where uh, people, human beings, who have not been charged with any crime uh, are locked up indefinitely with no time limit uh, awaiting deportation from the United Kingdom um, because they have been classified as, a, as an illegal migrant, even though that term in and of itself is incorrect uh, uh, because it is not a crime to claim asylum in any country, even if that asylum claim is ultimately uh, rejected. And a huge amount of that chapter, I realise now, I realise as you're saying this, is about language. And it's about the language that is being used um, to dehumanise um, certain parts of the population, uh, certain parts of our community, uh, an effort to stigmatise some so that the rest of us can cohere around some sort of unified national project. And although, um, as I hope came across in the talk, I, I am careful about making too many direct comparisons between Egypt and the UK because I appreciate just purely in terms of the, the risks to bodily integrity and the costs of doing any kind of protest or dissent uh, are, you know, absolute gulf between them. Um, I see genuine similarities. Um, I remember uh, saying to friends when the Daily Mail, uh, famous Daily Mail headline um, came out uh, about the judges who had ruled in favour of a legal case against Brexit and it was enemies of the, of the people. I remember saying um, to friends how familiar <laughs> this language was from... Uh, I, I, I get an email digest from Mother Moss, which summarises each day's newspaper headlines, largely state but also private newspaper headlines um, in Egypt. And uh, sometimes the language is virtually indistinguishable. Um, to try and finish on a positive note, uh, I mean, firstly, what, what, what can I do? I, I try and use language differently and use language in a way that gives... Not gives, but... Um, amplifies the voices uh, of those who are being dehumanised by, by those processes, being marginalised, being pushed to the, to the edge of the page. I refer to people being made both invisible and hypervisible. Their individuality is scrubbed out, and yet their status as a threat is magnified and amplified. Um, but I also with my work, try and seek out the stories of those who are subverting that and using language differently. And in that particular chapter, there is the story of um, a young woman called Yuzra from, uh, well, her family are from Sudan. She was actually born in Qatar, uh, who claimed asylum in Britain. That asylum claim was rejected. Uh, she's a young woman, she's 19, and who ended up in Yarl's Wood, which is one of the most notorious immigration detention centres um, in Britain. I talk about her journey and the fact that she has joined this amazing organisation called the Unity Collective in Glasgow, which is a migrants-led solidarity um, collective, who use language in a very different way. And one of the ways they do that is they don't talk about charity. They don't talk about uh, uh, support uh, in, in a kind of doctor-patient kind of problem diagnosis, cure kind of way. They talk about organisation and political solidarity. When people get through to them saying, uh, you know, I have someone on the mobile phone which we've smuggled into Yarlswood or Harmonsworth or whatever, uh, uh, you know, can you speak to them and tell them what to do? The the migrant collective unity say to the person uh, who's in immigration detention, talk to people around you, ask for their experiences, organise together, plot <coughs> together. We will do what we can from the outside, you can build from the inside. Um, when they organise uh, occupations of home office facilities, when they stop charter flights um, taking off uh, that are carrying uh, immigrant detainees kind of for deportation out of the country. Um, they talk 
in a language which is about re, not just rehumanizing, but reanimating ourselves as political agents, as agents capable of bending the future uh, to our own will rather than playing a bit part role in someone else's vision of the future. And I hope, I try with all of my journalism, whether it's Egypt or the UK, to constantly hone in on that and to excavate and stimulate and amplify that uh, because other people are doing that with language and with politics and in a small way I hope I can contribute to that as well. On that very positive note, I think we have to bring this to a close. Thank you so much, Jack, Thank you. for this wonderful